And there are people who have a strong ability to focus and people who have less of an ability. But all of us, and this is, I think, the, 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 the awakening we want to have, need to increase our ability to focus. You know, it's like driving a car. I'm in the driver's seat. And sometimes people, the kids sit shotgun, sometimes they sit in the back seat. Sometimes the book I'm working on is the front, or sometimes it's in the trunk, right? And everything takes rotation, but they all get time, energy, and focus. And I think that you really have to be that strategic about your life. Unless we are actively becoming more focused in all the areas of our life, from the most important to the least important, we are not going to be able to become better and extract all the great experiences that we're meant to have, all the growth that we're meant to have, and all the manifestation of our own potential that we're meant to have. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast, episode 46. Yay! Yay, it's still younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about something that I think is interesting. I only did a minute to uh, get on board. No? Not accurate. <laughs> so have you ever looked back on a week? And I don't think this actually will pertain to you, Michael, but have you ever looked back on a week and wondered where did it go? It's Friday afternoon. You're exhausted, but you're not much further along in all the things you had planned for the week than you were at Monday. You didn't get enough done. You were excited about things you were finally going to manifest, put energy into, only to discover, oh, you don't know. Where did your time go exactly? And where did you give it to? And where is it that you placed it? Where is it in things that were important to you? Or was it that you were just called and pulled and distracted in different ways by different people in different situations? There are so many distractions competing for our time. And unfortunately, we often sacrifice the things that are most important and purposeful to us. So the question I think we all need to ask ourselves at the start of this podcast is, are the distractions helping you or hindering you? Because, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, not all distractions are bad, in fact. So some of the other negative distractions, right? So let me give you a perfect example. And this is, I think, specific for everybody, but I think you're guilty specific of Specific for everybody. Yes, it is. It would be general for everybody then. Or specific general for, for everybody, but specific to you. You mostly do it. How much spend, How much time do you spend on your phone? So what would you say your screen time is most days? 11 hours a day? Nine and a half hours and a day. and computers or an iPads? Because when I'm, when I'm reading books, it's on my iPad. I know, I know. Yes, but also emails, texts, um, and we look at the news. But the thing is this, and I've done that, right? I've gone to my phone to look something up very purposefully. And then all of a sudden, a text message pops up and I get completely sidetracked. And then I go there. And then all of a sudden, now I'm in like this vortex of looking through all the texts that I never intended on reading in that hour because that hour is devoted for study, let's say. Um, and actually, there is, I think for most of us, it's 70 times a day. If you really use your phone, so many times a day you that pick it up just it up. for anything. Um, and there's actually a setting in your phone that will tell you how many times a day you pick up your phone, if you're curious. The way that it is successful, though, that it does help us, is that there is a virtual reality game designed by scientists at the University of Washington, Seattle, that demonstrates the extraordinary power of distractions and fighting pain. They took burn patients that are typically given large doses of medications to help them through excruciating pain of cleaning their wounds. Patients who played the game during wound cleaning felt up to 50% less pain. That's oh. remarkable. In fact, playing the virtual reality game was more effective at reducing pain than using medication. So the point is this. There are things that sometimes we need that will distract us. But the danger here is that if it keeps us from living a purposeful life. And there's a parable I want to share with you, and then I'm inviting you to speak, um, that is, it's about a king who rewards a member of his kingdom with an hour in the palace's room of treasures. In this hour, he's allowed to take as much as he desires. However, the king had a plan. He knew how much this man was a lover of music. So as the hour began, the king brought in the very best musicians in all of the land to perform. As the king suspected, the man thought to himself, I have an entire hour to collect treasures. And by the way, we do that a lot too, right? Like, oh, I have so much time and we tend to do, and then like we're stressing and we, what we should have done in a whole hour, we've like 15 minutes left to do, right? So he had that thought, right? It's a whole hour to collect treasures. Surely I can stop for a few moments to listen to such beautiful music. But before long, the hour had passed. And just when the man went to take his first treasure, a hand grabbed his wrist and said, your time is up. 
We come into this world, ultimately, right, to fulfill our soul's purpose. But we often veer off our course to pursue life's beautiful distractions. Or not so beautiful distractions. Or not, but we think they are, right? There's something that is alluring to us. Um, and I think we'll also unpack later that sometimes we just don't believe in ourselves enough. So we allow ourselves to be distracted or procrastinate because we're not sure how the outcome will actually be. Some people live 70 years as if it was just one day. But if we follow the spiritual path, we really have to kind of take control of our time, mostly, and our thoughts. So this is a very important topic, actually. Oh, the idea, you like it? I do like it. I do like it. And it's very important for all of us all the time. Because, as you mentioned, and I think we all know this intuitively and internally, each one of us has a unique purpose for which we came into this world. Each and every day that we live has its unique purpose. But the reality is that not just because of technology, but technology plays a large part, but also responsibility as we create families, create work, all very beautiful and important things, they all tug at our attention. And unfortunately, what often happens is that we live a life that is not focused. And what happens then is that we don't really accomplish. We maybe even sometimes touch upon important things, but don't see them to the end, don't see them completely. Which brings to mind two very important teachings. One of the great Kabbalists says that throughout our lives, we call it the negative side or that other side, jumps in front of us and holds a closed hand, making us believe everything we want is in that closed hand. And we spend life running after that closed hand. And the second before we leave this world, the hand opens up and we realize there was nothing in there. And I think that's really the fight between distraction and focus, where, and we've mentioned this a few times in other podcasts, it's not just simply, I am fighting my own internal desire to be distracted, but actually there's a force in this world inside of you, every one of us, whose purpose it is to try to distract us, to try to get us off the task, be it the the current task that I believe my soul needs to do today, or my life's task. A purposeful task. Yes, that's the first part. And the second part, which is related to this, is a teaching from Rav Ashlag. And he says that if you stand in front of a piece of wood for a thousand years and you hit it, softly. Chances are, even after a thousand years, you're never going to break it. But if you put all of your effort, I didn't do it right now, right? But if you put, <laughs> put all of your effort, you can break it in a moment. And when we understand that our important life's work, in all levels, whether it is how we are as a parent, whether it is how we are at work, is meant to be done with that intensity and focus. And that without intensity and focus, we can be dancing around important work all the time, but we never actually accomplish it. So when you say intensity and focus, I think that for sure that's true, but I think that the issue for many people is that intensity and focus they have suddenly moves over into a different category of something that's not really important, but it's shiny and it's something that's in front of them that they are fooled to believe. It's like that close foot will bring, right? So. For instance, if somebody found something that they really felt was connected to their soul, and it's hard, and it's difficult, and it's not always clear because you're like breaking through something every day, then something else comes, and it looks a little bit easier, but it also seems important. Not as important if we're being honest, right? But it's important to an aspect of ourselves, maybe not our soul. I think then that is where the intensity and the focus now is moved over to the wrong box. Right. That's some situations, right? So, so I think it's important to differentiate between actually probably three. One is the fact that our lives are so busy with important things. Like I said, everything I've, I've meant, you know, Children, family, right? spouse, that, that relationship, your work, that's important. Your spiritual work, that's important. Your personal wellness. Health, right? Health, sure. oh, so many important things. And technology sometimes helps and sometimes distracts. So it is easy in this context for most of us who have so much going, so much important things going on in our lives to give 
10% focus here, 15% focus here, and to live a life that is maybe involved in important things, but never truly focused on any one of them. Right. So for example, just to give an example, which I've, I've given a few times, but it's, there's a very big difference between, and I know that I've, I've failed at this, and I'm assuming that you have at times. You, For instance, you can be with your children, and not be but are you there at 100%? Right. Are you there at ninety percent? Are you there at ten percent? You can be at your work. You could be there at one hundred percent, at ninety percent, at ten percent. So I think a big part of the understanding is that how do I bring myself to be at a hundred percent of all the things that I am doing, rather than saying, "Well, I'm sitting with my family, but I'm worrying about something that's going on at work," or "I'm at work and I'm worrying about something that's going on with my family." You're feeling guilty you're not with your family. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one level, which is how do we get better? And I think and I think part of this is is the training of the mind to be able to because and and and, and science tells us that in any given moment we are receiving. Sti we are receiving, call it distractions, but stimuli. As I'm sitting here right now, my mind sees that there's a, a cabinet there. It sees that there's trees out there. It hears the buzzing of the of the fly. It also knows that I'm recording a podcast. So out of the thousand different stimuli, I have to train myself to focus on the most important task at hand. That is, and as science also tells us, is a muscle, the ability to focus and to what degree we are able to remove Disassociate from anything around all you. the other stimuli, even if they are important, but not not as important as the task at the hand. The way I look at it is like if you have a surgeon operating on a brain, right? It is so urgent, immediate, fragile, important, and he can't mess up, right? We do that in terms of things that we feel are immediate and urgent, and and you cannot neglect. But I think that that is the energy in which we need to put into all the things that we actually want to accomplish, whether they are immediate or not. Because if you don't see them that way, year after year, it's going to go on a different to-do list and a different thing. And maybe it, you'll still want to do it, but you never get to it. Or maybe you get distracted so much that you don't even think it's important anymore. Or even worse, and this I think is probably more insidious and more dangerous, is that you're actually going to be doing all those important things, but you're not really there. You're not 100% present. And, and therefore, I think probably the first takeaway for me and for you, because I, I, I get inspired about this as we talk about this, and I hope our, our listeners do as well, the important things in our lives, we're mostly doing distracted. Think about that. The important things in life. The time, you know, again, uh, two nights ago, you were, at, you were in Los Angeles, and I went out for dinner with our daughter, with, with Abigail. And I was very conscious of the fact that I want to make sure that for this, it was an hour and a half dinner, or however long it was, that I am doing nothing except listening being present. There. <laughs> Most, mostly listening to her, sharing, or coming up. You know, the, way, the way that dinner came about, as Monica knows, is that she said, you know, I don't really know you enough. And she really wanted to but get. She was in a bit really, of pain about it, and she's yes. like, "I just know his favorite color and his which birthday. isn't exactly true, but of that course was not. Her. But she's very dramatic, so when she feels something, of course, it's going to be, you know. So we said we'll go to dinner, and you can ask me all the questions that I can share with you. In reality, she spent forty-five, most ninety-five percent of the dinner sharing with me, which is beautiful. She just as wanted well. to connect. Yes, yeah. but again, but for me, and I think it's important all of us think about this. I could have been there at 100%, I could have been there at 50%, I could be there at 20%. And I think the first awakening we should have is this consciousness, whatever I am doing, and by the way, like if you're doing important, what's important? Well, if you're going to the beach for the day, be there, right? If you're spending time with your wife, be there. If you're spending time with your child, be there. If you're spending time at work, be there. So wherever you are, be 100%. Right. I often, you know, there was this one woman I knew, and she was always distracted. And you could tell that she just, she always felt like she was disappointing somebody. It was her own thing, right? So one day, um, she'd come to a connection, a spiritual connection, and she looked, she had that face on again. I didn't say anything. Next thing I know, she walks into a wall, and I just pull her aside. I said, listen, you are here. Do you want to be here right now? She said, yes. I said, then be here fully. And you're going to go and do be with your family or whatever she was, you know, feeling that divide about. Um, but I think I thought that that was such an appropriate example because she literally was like so, dis she just walked into a wall. 
And and again, the problem and, and, and again, the problem with not and you have to actively pursue this. This is like dieting. This is like anything important. This is not something that will happen just because you hear a podcast and say, "Oh, I, I want like to do that." Dieting, this. but it's about committing. Well, the, my point is, you know, committing. It has to, it has to be an effortful process to get from where I and you are to get to from where any one of our listeners are at to a hundred a life filled with a hundred percent being present or a hundred percent focused. That's going to take work. That will not happen naturally. As a matter of fact, left to our natural devices, we will continue to live a life with distractions. So basically, and it's back to that word a lot of people use, but being mindful about each and everything that you are actually being present and 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 removing all the external stimuli, be they important or not important. And this is the other side, which is again. You might have had a fight with your spouse, and that's important. It's going to be important when you get home, whenever you see each other again, to really to fix that, to talk through that. But if you're having dinner with your kid right now, even that important thought, right? How do you? That's definitely a muscle, though. Definitely. Yeah, a absolutely. Muscle. Science tells us it's a muscle, yeah. and, and and that and that it is either. And there are people who have a strong ability to focus, and people who have less of an ability. But all of us, and this is, I think, the, 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 the awakening we want to have, need to increase our ability to focus. As a matter of fact... But by the way, it's just not just focus, because it is, but more than that, you have to understand the bigger picture, which is the consciousness I think we're trying to give, right? Meaning? At the end of the day, the fight that you have or don't have, you're going to come to some solution or resolution one way or the other. Right. And so instead oh, with your spouse, you with your spouse yeah. the example you just gave. So instead of feeling worrying about that, ruining now the dinner and not having connection with another person that's very important to emotionally your child, then you're going to feel badly about that later too. Right. So, but if you have the understanding that big picture and the big scheme of things, yes, that fight was horrible. I'm really uncomfortable. I really want to go back and repair. Or maybe you're not feeling that positive, whatever it is. But then to allow that to steal the now from you, it's just, you can go through life like that forever, and then you're not going to make anything of any moment. And I, I just want to underline, underscore one one thing you said, destroy the dinner. I think the point is, if somebody had a fight with their spouse, using this example, and they went to dinner with a friend or with their child, and they didn't destroy the dinner, right? I think, I think the more insidious and yeah. dangerous part is that they had a great dinner. They were, yeah, they were distracted. They were probably listening to 75% of what their kid was saying. The kid couldn't tell really the difference. I think kids but, can always tell. But you robbed yourself of the opportunity to have an unbelievable dinner. And I think that's the point. Because, you know, the um, in, in, in King Solomon, one of the wise men, said that the soul or the, or the, the spirit of the person who does not accomplish is almost... And I think that's such an important understanding. Because, again, when you come home, if, if a person came home from that dinner and he or she destroyed it and they felt really bad about it, there's more chance you'll change. Mm -hmm. But if it was an okay dinner, like I, I was there 75%, even 80%, the problem is, first of all, you haven't grabbed the opportunity to, to, to grow your focus muscle, but also you robbed yourself of the opportunity to receive so much more from that dinner. You know, I use this example a lot, but... I remember years ago, I was um, walking with, at the time, our older daughter Miriam. She was probably six or seven years old at the time, from our house in Los Angeles to, the, to, the, to, uh, to an event at the center, which was five blocks away. And she was skipping along and singing, being, you know, happy cute and, and happy. And, and now my mind was somewhere else, somewhere maybe even important. And I remember telling myself, you know, right here, you with your daughter, she's at this age, at this day for, you know, a limited amount of time, be there. And the amount of joy that I extracted from that from those few minutes of walk was much greater than it would have been had I kept on thinking about the really important thing that I was and just holding my daughter's hand and 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 continuing to walk. It's almost like missing every beautiful sunset that's right outside your window because you're too busy looking at your computer screen worrying about something that you probably have to deal with. But bigger picture, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why. It says that one of my there's a story in the in the Bible one of my one of my more favorite ones where Jacob it says he's wrestling with an angel mm -hmm. and he says to the angel tell me your name and according to the Zohar the Kabbalistic text this story represents the constant battle that each one of us has with the negative forces within us and he says tell me your name 
And the angel says, why do you ask my name? And that is the end of the story, which seems to be a very uneventful and anticlimactic end to the story. Why? <laughs> Jacob, yeah. Jacob does not ask for his name again. He just says, why do you ask my name? And the Kabbalists say something really beautiful and profound, which is that he was actually telling him his name. He was giving him the understanding of that force that distracts us. He was saying, why do you ask? Meaning, why are you trying to pay attention I never and read understand? It like that. I love that. Yes, why do you ask my name? Because we go through life. Oh my God, I love that. Not delving That's deeply good. into moments, thoughts, emotions. And that focus and that or lack of focus mm -hmm. is what keeps us distracted and what keeps us not living our potential. You know, there's a study that was done uh, with athletes and they found that. Athletes that were distracted, either these are cal college level athletes who were distracted by either um, any types of fears or, or anxieties while they were training, they could co correlate the, the the those who were better athletes during the season with the ones who were less distracted in the preseason or in, in the training. And the, the and this There's is preparation, really. Well, the point is that distraction leads to a lesser ability to be our best. Yes, because if you are distracted while you are in the process of learning and doing to become your best, right? which is the sunset, which is the dinner with your child, you are distracted to all, through all of those moments, then when you need to really rely on yourself and say, OK, how am I manifesting these big things, you are actually, you, you have more of a weaker foundation. Yeah. Because in the practice of it, you weren't fully engaged. Absolutely, and that's and and there's there's a really good book on this. It's called I do recommend to our listeners if you are interested to learn a little bit more on more on the scientific side. Daniel Goleman has a book called Focus, which yes. uh, which delves more deeply into the scientific view on this. But it really all again dovetails with the spiritual view. And again, for me, the first maybe most important awakening is the fact that unless we are actively becoming more focused in all the areas of our lives from the most important to the least important, we are not going to be able to become better and extract all the great experiences that we are meant to have, all the growth that we are meant to have, and all the manifestation of our own potential that we are meant to have. I don't want to bring this to a, a down kind of place, but you know, I have been thinking about death a lot. <laughs> um, it has been a month since... Uh... Again, I, I think we established, I actually am very inspired by the concept of death, but yes. <laughs> Uh, it's been a month since my father passed, actually exactly uh, this past week. Um, so that makes sense on some level. But I'm looking at it at from a spiritual and psychological process. So not really just about death, but just everything that that that, that process looks like from beginning to end. Um, so my thoughts veer to the unseen force that not only affects our physical body, right, but is the death of, or the demise of relationships, prosperity, and happiness, right? Because there's many kinds of deaths in a lifetime. And I do think that this does lead, um, or is connected to allowing yourself to be distracted through life. So there's a quote um, from Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now, which I love his book, but he said, death is the stripping away of all that is not you. The secret of life is to die before you die and find that there is no death. So I had to read that twice to really see what I felt about it. Um, and, you know, we get attached, right, to to things that make us feel good in life. And it's it's normal on some level because we are physical beings. And as we've talked a lot about this in our podcast, it's about exercising our free will and making good choices for ourselves and where we're going to put energy and time into. And that's part of our evolution. But sometimes it can go too far and it can hamper us from living a spiritual existence. So... Totally described a death that is useful, but I think it should be more about the stripping away of what we're attached to and therefore allowing ourselves to be distracted by, right? So I've I've talked about um, David Foster Wallace a lot. This is one of my favorite quotes, but I and it, it's from his commencement speech at Kenyon College, and he elaborated on this idea. So I just want to read it um, because again, I just think it's so powerful and it says it so eloquently. He says, if the day to day in the day to day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. 
and an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan mother goddess or the four noble truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, bromides, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. So we get so connected to these concepts of what we strive for and what we think we love, like you said at the beginning, the hand that you're chasing, that we forget to put in the work of truly elevating ourselves. And we might run out of time while we're still on this earth. And that's what motivates me about death, right? It's exactly this concept. So, right, so what you're saying, and this is another level which is important to, to, to focus on, that we spoke about being distracted by important things. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about being distracted by the unimportant things. Because I tend to think this is where most of us I live. Think, I think we probably, we, we fail at both. We do, but I don't think we're as... But how many, I mean, let's be honest. Again, just I don't want to go back to the, how many of us are are hundred percent present at all the no we're not hundred percent present anywhere so yeah. much. but 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 this is certainly a very important idea as well how much time do we spend worried about things that are not really important and this is and, and it's kind lasting, of crazy not lasting you cannot these things that he talked about you you can chase you're never going it will never be enough as he said and and again you and I often have this conversation which is you know, it's you're talking about somebody or somebody who behaved badly, right? Or, or or somebody who who you know maybe we think isn't doing the right thing. And for me, it's always that balance between: Do I want to spend? How much time do I want to spend? You can call it distracted or not talking distracted. Talking about the person or helping. Talking or even dealing. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there are times where you do need to deal. It's the right thing, but life. You you're know, you're really good at that. Life though. is just too short, and, and you've helped me become better at that. Too important. To really give any time and 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 mind space to be distracted by that. And by the way, I was actually having a conversation with somebody the other day. He was he's going through you know he's going through certain uh, challenges at work. Mm -hmm. He's building he's in, building a business and and um, there's all kinds of issues. And he was sharing about how difficult it was for him because. You know, he's worrying about it all the time, 24 hours a day, working, you know, 18 hour days and so on and is so forth. Is it worth it? <laughs> well, what I said, and, and I strongly believe this to be true, is that the reason he was so upset is not so much about whether the business is doing well or not doing well, or whether he will succeed or won't succeed. It's that he has internally created a correlation between his business success. And, the, and and whether he is successful, mm -hmm. so he has married those two, mm -hmm. and now any worry has to redefine what success exactly. means. To him. And I said, and I said, and I believe this to be very true. And he agreed when I said this is that probably five percent of his worry is about the business. The other ninety five percent of the stress that he's feeling is because his ego is attached to the success or lack of success. And if he was able to simply focus on the business and whatever worry or not worry has to be in the business, he'd have 95% less stress. Because the pain is really coming from his attachment to exactly. his ego. And exactly. Have, so if, so, and that is the ultimate distraction. Exactly. And that's why I think, you know, to, to your point, even things that we should be concerned about, even things that we should be dealing with, how much of our ego is invested in that? And one of the ways to know is how distracting is it for me? Usually, that level of distraction caused by even things we do have to deal with is because our ego is attached to it. And therefore, I think the second element of really two groups, one of them are things that we really shouldn't be distracted with at all. Okay, I was at that party and this person really treated me badly. 
cares? <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? Life's too short. I'm busy. I have so many important things to be putting my, my focus on. And second, even if it is something I need to deal with, and even if it is something that I need to care about, but am I dealing with it because I need to deal with it? How much of my own ego is involved in the stress and the upset? In Here's it? the trick, right? As you were speaking, I started thinking about Alice in Wonderland, right? She gets curious. She opens the bottle. I never liked that. I'm sorry. But anyway, I don't remember the details that accurately. But she then gets stuck in a different reality. And one thing after the other, because she was curious about something, maybe she got distracted by something. That's the thing with distractions. Once you go down that road, right? So let's say you, you become obsessed with the thing the person said about you. And how did they say that? And why did they do that? And, and that was a distraction. You had a really busy day, but now you're so upset about an encounter that happened earlier. Now, then you're going to have to go talk to this person about it. And you're going to teach them a lot, right? Now you're, you're spending the next day, two days, three days on something that never should have even taken a minute of your time. And that is the danger of getting distracted yeah, by it's fine. I was laughing things. because Daniel Goldman uses the example of um, Larry David, who mm -hmm. uh, many of you probably know, he created Kirby. Seinfeld, and Kirby he has Kirby enthusiasm, which I really like. And um, so he, te he tells the story that he went to Yankee Stadium one day. He lives in the LA. Larry David did. Larry David did. And, um, and you know, often they, when there's a celebrity, they put their picture on the, on the, the big, screen. Jump, big screen. So they put his picture on, like, all, like, 40,000 people stood up and clapped for him and, you know, were really supportive. On his way out of the stadium, one guy yells at him, you stink, or whatever, something negative, right? And Larry Davis said, I spent the whole next few hours just thinking about that, you know, one. that one guy, right? As if those 40, <laughs> not wasn't 40,000 people who, who and, and that's the point, right? I, I hate to admit, I'm a, you've, got, you've made me so much better because you're actually training me without knowing it. Like I'll say to you something and you're like, I don't know, I don't know, oh, something like that. And it's such a, it's such a non-fulfilling conversation that I don't even now <laughs> ask you. the question. No, because, but by the way, I don't even think we should talk about that, right? Um, but this did happen. I gave a webinar uh, last week, back to back, and like all of positive, right? People, one comment. This isn't what I thought. It, it wasn't even that negative. But it wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought it'd be more of a seminar style. This is more a workshop. I, the next night, so it was a two night thing. All I heard was that That's sentence for the whole, and I was just like, "This is so stupid. You know better." But it's yeah. <laughs> So, it's yeah, a training for sure. For sure. And and again, I, I think that what, what we're saying is that we have to be training ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I, actually, I just read a short section, if if, if it's okay, from, uh, from Daniel Goldman's book, because there's actually a part of our brain, which not coincidentally is hidden uh, behind the, the, the frontal cortex of the... Well, that's going to grow or not based on how you behave. Well, so listen, so right. yes. Yes, I'm not, I, so, I understand that. Uh, so it, it's called the insula. Mm -hmm. And it's tucked behind the frontal lobes of the brain. The insula maps our body's insides via circuitry linking to our gut, our heart, liver, lungs, and genitals. Every organ has its specific spot in the insula. Interesting. This lets the insula act as a control center for organ functions, sending signals to the heart to slow its beat, the lungs to tape a, take a deeper breath. Attention turned inward toward any part of the body amps up the insula sensitivity to the particular area we're checking in on. Right? So how often, like, oh, I feel something in my heart, oh, I feel something in my back, right? Mm. That, when you're having that thought, the insula then awakens more neurons in those areas of your body, so it actually feels it more. So, for example, he uses mm. this example, tune into your heartbeat, and the insula activates more, partic more neurons in that circuitry of the insula that is connected to the heart. And that affects it in a negative way or a positive? No, no. It just allows you to feel your heart more than you did before that. Interesting. So the, the, the introspective part of the brain, even as it relates to the body, is, is the insula. And this is really interesting. How well people can sense their heartbeat, in fact, has, has become a standard way to measure their self-awareness. Mm. So there's a real correlation between how strong your insula is and feeling the physical parts of your body to your ability to be introspective and, and self-aware. The be better people are at this, the bigger their insula. So mm -hmm. the insula actually grows or becomes smaller or weaker. The insula attunes us to more than our organs. Our very sense of how we are feeling depends on it, right? So, and, and this we know, right? Whether I'm happy now or not is not often, usually, not related to what's happening around me, but, but how I feel about it. And that is controlled by the insula. People who are oblivious to their own emotions, and also tellingly, as we'll see, to how other people feel, have sluggish insula activity, 
compared with the high activation found in people highly attuned to their inner emotional life. I just love the body yeah. and science and everything. You cannot deny that there is something greater at power here. It's just crazy. At the And so just a few more sentences. At the tuned out, so I mean, right, all of us, I think, on some level, need to be paying more attention to what is going on inside. But you know, there are the. Um, he talks about the extreme. Yeah. At the tuned out extreme are those with alexthymia, which I hope I pronounce it right, who just don't know what they feel. That right is there, so right? interesting. But it's true. Again, all of us, to certain degrees, and we often have this conversation where, and you often come with these realizations where you're having a feeling, but then you really have to take the time to look inside and where is it really coming from? And there are people who are incapable. <laughs> Um, and can't imagine what someone else might be feeling. Our gut feelings are messages from the insula and the other circuits that that uh, simplify life decisions by guiding our attention towards smarter options. The better we are at reading these messages, the better our intuition. So, and maybe we'll save this for for another podcast. But this understanding that that the insula, which which is both obviously serves a physical function, but it also serves an emotional and I would say a spiritual function, the ability to become more in tune with our internal voice, right? And this is, I think, one of the most important parts, and probably deserves its own podcast. But I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. But every one of us has all the wisdom that we need the answer to every question that we have inside. But as the famous quote goes, in order to hear, you have to be silent. And I think one of the greatest damages that our distracted lives lead to is that we do not pay enough attention to the great wisdom and direction that each one of us has within us. And when you work the muscle of focus, you're also working your ability to hear your inner voice more powerfully. Because I think what happens in life, I know this is what happens, is that because we are distracted by good things, by bad things, everything we spoke about until now, it all, all that all that noise does not allow us to really listen to the internal voice that is coming from our soul, that has all the answers, that knows the right thing to do, we talk that about knows where we should focus. A lot, especially when my father was passing, and then you know, different people would ask me, like, how is so-and-so in your family feeling? How is this person? Is that? And funnily enough, now that you're bringing it up, I would just say, well, she's not really sure how, how she's feeling. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot of feelings, right? And I think that this is so accurate, because if you don't take the time in life to really not just connect to your soul, but exactly to really be able to tap into such a level where you're not, your, your body is actually telling you things and you're telling your body then this and working, this beautiful soul. harmony. Of course. So all of it, it's like the circuitry, right? Body, mind, and spirit, but that's really what it means. And that's what it looks like. And when you don't actually live like that, then when you're 70 or 60 or 80, you're like, everything's really confusing because you haven't lived that way for your entire life. And then when things get a little bit more stagnant or scary or stuck or, you know, just uncertain later in life, then you're really kind of at a loss. And your mother actually, there's this quote from her and it, it really ties into this. She was talking about meditation and how to connect to your inner light. And she said, when it comes to meditation, oftentimes we're asked to close our eyes and seek silence. Isn't it funny that when we want to see more, we close our eyes? Isn't it interesting that when we want to hear more, we need to seek silence? This is because our answers are found within and not without. The universe within is far greater than the universe on the outside. Sometimes all we need to do to find it is to let go of all distractions. So it's exactly. absolutely so perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> two quotes related to this as well. Um, well, Anne Treisman says, how we deploy our attention determines what we see, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a, uh, Star, a Star, uh, Star Wars Yoda quote, who says, <laughs> your focus, <laughs> well, I am not, no, your focus is your reality. And that, again, leads us back to this understanding. And I think it starts with this clarity. Every single one of us has all the wisdom that we need. When you start there, when you know that Everything, like the quote you just read from my mother, everything is inside. But, and they want to, can't stress this enough, it's, it takes time and effort. 
If you're not working on this every day, practice, practice, focus, right? Really, really fighting for focus, fighting for being present, then all the amazing intuition and wisdom that you have inside will not be heard by you. And I think this is where time comes in because when we first got married, I was this muscle for me was not very developed at all. And especially because at that time I was very much a people pleaser. So it was like, oh, you need something. Let me see, how can I help you? And then at the end of the day, I felt depleted, unhappy, and I wasn't even inching my way anywhere near something that was fulfilling for me. Um, But I think it's about really being able to manage your time and understand time, right? Because that, unless you are a timekeeper in that way, and that means that you really value every second that you have, and you're like, okay, this is the bigger picture. This is the biggest focus. This is the number one goal. And I have all these other aspects of my life that are important. But in this moment, right now, for this hour, even if you have to break it down for these 10 minutes, for those 40, I am going to be 100% present in this space. And then in an hour's time, I'll go check on that other thing that's important to me. I really learned how to do that. People often ask me, you know, how do you manifest different things? You, know, you seem to do this and you do that. And you, like different, I, I, you know, it seems like I'm successful in different areas. Like I give a lot of time to my kids, my husband. There's many things that are important to me. And it's not that I'm great or stellar. I just learned, I think, to be able to do this. I always say that, you know, it's like driving a car. I'm in the driver's seat. And sometimes people, the kids sit shotgun. Sometimes they sit in the back seat. Sometimes the book I'm working on is the front or sometimes it's in the trunk, right? And everything takes rotation, but they all get time, energy, and focus. And I think that you really have to be that strategic about your life. You know, if you had like a pie and you put, okay, these are the three areas that are most important to me. And then you look at how the percentages, you know, how much time goes to taking care of yourself? How much is it for your career? How much is your family? And you can see how disproportionate it is, right? There's many things that we can do that can actually get us to be able to practice being focused. And I would say also, ask yourself the question, when was the last time you had time on your own to think about yourself? If you, unless you're doing that... We have to define what think about yourself means, because that's very broad to say it like that. What is important to me? what is my focus what is the what is that i believe or i feel i should be doing today this week this month this year i think it's two that questions that internal that internal dialogue you know mm-hmm. whether some people do it with meditation some people do it with prayer but that quiet time with yourself unless you are consistently having that you're almost guaranteed to live a distracted life I think it's two questions. The first is, what is really important to me? And then that question alone is going to make you have a, a laser focus. It's like, oh, well, was um, is gossiping where I spend most of my time? Even though I think it's important, right? Or is you know working on this project? Right? Just asking the question makes you stop and look at how you're actually spending your time. And then once you've identified what's important, then the second question is, okay, how much time did I actually put there? And if you ask yourself that at the beginning of every day and the end of every night, Event, that's how you get the muscle, right? Um, there is this tool that I do want to offer uh, that I think is kind of amazing. And I discovered it in writing, you know, I'm working on my next book, Change Junkie. Um, and I don't think I fully understood this when I was writing Rethink Love, but it's this idea of non time, not non like the bread, non time. Um, and it's basically where you give yourself some time to actually zone out so you can be creative. And this is going to sound counterintuitive to what we've been speaking about, but actually it works quite well. So if I asked you to do something, or nothing rather, for 15 minutes, could you do it? To do nothing? Literally yeah. nothing? Well, I'm going to define what nothing okay. is, right? Because I know right away you're like, oh, that's a waste of time. What is nothing? And by the way, your brain wouldn't even let you do that. You'd start thinking about everything except nothing. <clears throat> but... Um, I'll give you an example to two great giants in terms of uh, what they've revealed in the world. Uh, Einstein's greatest ideas came to him while bobbing along the water in his 23-foot sailboat in a breezeless afternoon. And you wouldn't necessarily think Einstein sailing, like he did so many things. He revealed so, so no, creative. I didn't know that. Contrary to popular opinion, Steve Jobs was an exceptional procrastinator. Given to daydreaming and seemingly absent no- noodling, and doodling on ideas that would revolutionize work and play. They both excelled in the field of ideal idea incubation, utilizing something researchers have come to call non-time. 
And this is where I want to take a page from their book. For me, non-time is dancing. I've talked about this a lot. My workout, and while for a lot of people, exercise would not be considered non-time, for me, it's a time where my body is just moving like crazy. My mind is just like, oh, you know, and lots of thoughts coming in and out of there. And I'm frantically running to my phone after to jot down notes that have come to me or ideas that have come in that process. And actually, they did, um, the scientists that worked on this, they said that that was absolutely one of the things. They said exposure to nature, strenuous exercise, which I thought was interesting, and electronic abandonment. These were the three things that were considered very useful non-time. Um, and they took a group of people, actually, this is how they came to understand this. His name is David Strayer, and he's a cognitive neuroscientist specializing in multitasking. And he did a study at with outward bound students. He gave half of a group of hikers a creativity quiz prior, prior to sending them backpacking in the wilderness. The other half were tested on their fourth day in a cleansed of, when they were cleansed of their screens and the pressures of the material world to post, comment, and like. The second group scored a whopping 50% better on remote, associated, on remote associates tests, which asked people to identify word associations that are immediately obvious than the first cohort suggesting scientific proof to what many of us instinctively know. We are better, more creative, and more in tune with the universe and our place in it when we allow ourselves the room to unplug. So this idea of just going away from, I think, the routine, the day-to-day, -day, all of those external things, sailing, right? It's taking you out of the element, the environment that you used to, that you know, right? All those things that you said, like the pot, like we're sitting in this room, there's this, there's that. If I sit in this room, likely it's not really going to be non-time for me, right? But if I go take myself outside of that, right? For me, the strenuous exercise, sailing, coloring for some people, it creates a space where you are able to actually fully focus. Yeah, no, actually, and it's a scientific fact that 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 the brain does a lot of its sort of uh, problem computer, solving. Yeah, yeah, while where you're driving, your and your mind is distracted, but it's actually exactly it's actually computing and 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 um, and working. Um, maybe I have a podcast in the next few weeks around really the tools to listen to our inner voice besides. Mm -hmm the removal of distraction, because the last thing I wanted to say like on, sure. on this is the fact that why is it so important to go to nature? And the capitalists would say it's very important, because we spoke about the internal voice that we have, but there's actually, it's called the song of nature, right? There's actually every, a tr the tree is attached to a reality that is truer than the distractions of what we often go through in our in our world. Well, it's the world. It's the world of truth, right? It's, it's right. A different it's more realm, connected to it. Yes. So that's why when you go to nature, that's why when you disconnect from electronics, that's why there, there you you are putting yourself in a place that is more able to be in tune with truth, more in tune with the the your own internal truth and the truth that is actually going on all around you. You can access that much more readily. Exactly. And and again, just back to bringing this whole thing the whole concept all the way around, unless you are actively fighting for focus, you won't hear your internal voice, you won't hear the external voices of truth going on around you. Yeah, I was driving um, yesterday, actually, and you know I love hummingbirds. I think they have, they're very spiritual animals. For me, I feel very connected to them, and I feel like there's always like a message. So literally, it came right in front of my windshield, very low, and it's just like going back and forth and fluttering, whatever. I'm like, so I stopped it, and I'm like looking up, like, okay, what am I supposed to be aware of now? You know, like it took me out of, you know, I was late, whatever, life, and it just made me take pause and say, okay, what what should I, is there something else I need to know right now? Nice. So, uh, it's a little bit late, so we won't get to a letter today, hopefully next uh, podcast, but... Um, is it late? It is late. Well, yeah. later than we thought. Um, I'd like to ask all of our listeners again, if you are inspired by what we share, make sure to share this podcast with all of your oh, friends. I have a question for you, though. Oh, here we go. What is um, <laughs> something that you think distracts you most? Like, is there one thing that continually gets you? Yeah, I think for me, it's the first category we spoke about, which is, and I am mindful of this, right, but that there's so many important things that, that I'm responsible for, or important things that I want to accomplish, that it's often that challenge of balance, okay, because literally you have to say, I'm not going to take care of this really important thing, or I'm not going to focus on this really important thing, because I have to do this other important thing. So I think a big part of my, I don't want to say struggle, because it's not that much of a struggle, but the decision that I have, decisions that I have to make is, 
and I literally every, every week I ask myself the question. I look back at the week. I look forward to the next week. Okay, I accomplished. I I did this. I don't accomplish is an interesting word. I did this, this, and that. Is it really moving to you towards what you your life's purpose is? And not that anything that I that I am involved in, you know, in the work side is not important. But is it the most important? Is it the place where my greatest focus should be? And that's the constant struggle, right? Because you know, it's, like I said, especially when you're involved in a lot of important things. The question has to be: What is and this is a lot comes from the internal voice? What is the most important? And at least, what is the most important for today? What is the most important for this moment? What is the most important for this week? It's interesting because I think it's. I think you kind of have to look at it this way. And all the things that I achieved this week, that I achieved this week, or that I put energy into, that was important. What what did I sacrifice? And you might not even realize that you did. Right? It's just a loss of an opportunity to connect to other things that were important to you. And so I think that it's, again, goes back to that self-awareness to really be in tune to all the things that matter to you. Like after this podcast, you know, Abigail, our youngest, doesn't usually watch anything on a weeknight, but because I was traveling all week and um, we have a thing where we watch Harry Potter, you know, as you know, every Sunday we're catching up on all of them. And so we only, this past Sunday, because of Mother's Day, we're so busy, we watched only half of it. So we're gonna go cuddle and watch an hour. And by the way, not gonna look at the phone, not going to work. I have a ton of work to do, but not because why? And this week, if I didn't connect with her in that way that I know she needs, and by the way, that I need, it's going to be that what what it's what, was all the work I did worth it if I'm also not able to give to the other things that are so important. Absolutely. So thanks, Monica. If you enjoyed this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, if you're inspired by it, please make sure because to, you enjoy this podcast. Because, because you're inspired. There you by go. It. Share it with all your friends, family. Go to Apple Podcasts uh, to this podcast. Give five star reviews. Write reviews because we do this to inspire. And the more people this reaches, the more uh, we are inspired to uh, to do this week to week. Um, I think most of you know it's available on YouTube, on Facebook. It's available in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Hebrew. And make sure to keep sending us your questions, stories, and comments to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. Monica and A and D Michael at Kabbalah.com. We are in, even if we don't get to share all of the stories that you share with us, we are inspired by them tremendously. And we try to get to all the questions and often build our podcast around the questions that you send. So make sure to keep on sending everything, comments, stories questions, topic ideas to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. And I hope you enjoyed this listening to this podcast. As yep. much as we enjoyed getting recording it. Recording it. Recording it. There you go. Bye.